the Lord of the Hunt, the Master of Beasts. Listen for the horn as you hurtle through the forest. Hear its full sound resonate among the trees. The chase has begun, mortal. The huntsman is in pursuit. I pray you give him good sport, for if you're captured too quickly, then your head will be struck from your shoulders and stuck on a spear, ready to be paraded through the hunting grounds. The sun has fallen, and you yet live. Well done, mortal. But now the blood moon is rising, the trees are closing in around you, and the gnarled boughs are reaching through the shadows. Tread lightly, and listen for hoofs and paws padding over brush and leaf. You stop to catch your breath, and then you see it. Between the trees, pale white, the spectral skull of a great elk. In the pits of its eyes lie two incandescent orbs of crimson. Its bestial maw opens in a ghastly grin. Well met, my prey. The spear of bitter mercy is thrust into your gut, and the rattle of death from your lips is your only response to the prince's welcome. The twilight silver-green leaves of the forest are splashed red with fresh blood. The metallic scent of gore and glory fill the air. Another quarry for the lord of the chase. Long live Hercene, lord of the hunt. Hercene is an imposing figure. He makes no efforts to conceal his prowess. He's a hunter, and he respects power and persistence. Many would call him barbarous, claiming he only cares for primitive displays of bestial brutality. But there is a lesser-known story of her scene, from a time before the rise of mortals on Tamriel, and this tale is one the huntsman would rather keep secret. Once upon a time, her scene looked upon Nern with adoration. He wanted to be a part of creation, only the story did not end well. Should you hear this story, you would surely weep for the prince. This is the tragic tale of Hercene, as told by the silent priests and clan mothers of elsewhere. Khajiit spirituality offers a unique perspective on the role of the gods in the lives of mortals. As a daedrologist, constantly pondering the question of what exactly defines a daedra, I find that talking to people who see the world entirely differently to me is crucial. So I walked the beaten paths of Skyrim in search of a trade caravan, and when I found one, I sat with the roving vagrants, sharing bread and fish. They told me tales of the various spirits that make up their pantheon, a pantheon that dismisses any distinctions between Adric and Daedric. And it was the tale of three worldly spirits that caught my attention. The Khajiit believe that the Orbis began with two littermates, Anur and Fadamai. Fadamai gave birth to all the gods, including Nerni, who was given a very special gift. She was to be a mother just like Fadamai. She would give birth to all the races of man, myrrh, and beast on Tamriel. She is the green mother, the spirit of harmony, and her presence can be felt in the warm sands, dense jungles, and all places where mortals have not disturbed the earth. Now, the Khajiit personify Nern more than most cultures do but the parallels to human and elven myths are clear. The interplay of the primordial forces of light and darkness, Anu and Padamai, gave birth to Nern, the Grey Maybe. Nern is the physical world that the Aedra created in the dawn. She is Gaia, she is Mother Earth. We know that the original spirits, the Atada, contributed their power and their ideas into the creation of a tangible Nern, a place for mortals to exist. Lorcan provided the inspiration, Magnus formulated the blueprints, and the distinction we tend to make between Aedra and Daedra comes from those who did elect to commit their power to Nern's creation, and those who did not. Hence the meanings ancestor and not our ancestor. We can go into endless detail about what constitutes the title of ancestor and not ancestor, especially in the tumultuous dawn era, when time and history wasn't so rigid. But after hearing the folklore of the cats, I believe that Hercene the Hunter was not always an adversary of the Aedra, and I believe he initially wanted to be a part of creation. This notion may be considered heretical to men and myrrh, but the story is compelling, and the idea that creation was so absolute, so black and white, seems ridiculous to me. These gods have their own will, their own motivations and desires and biases. It's what makes them so fascinating to us, for we mortals are modelled after the gods in many ways. Just as Ifri was the god of the forests and the green during creation, I believe Hercene was supposed to be the god of all the beasts that inhabit the wilds. 
Before he wore the stag's head, her scene was an Aedra no less seraphic than the Divine's. Her scene stood beside Ifa, Kanafi, and Azura. He watched in awe as Nerni took shape. She was beautiful, resplendent. She wore a dress of every colour imaginable. Viridescent green in places, deep cascading blue in others. The hues came to life in the radiance of Magris's sunshine, and her hair flowed like ripe wheat beneath Kanafi's breath. Her scene fell instantly and deeply in love with Nerni at that moment. He saw the deserts and oceans and forests that made up her vari-coloured dress, and he was inspired. He would govern all of the animals that live upon her, and it would be a wondrous collaboration. The Atada began to interact with Nerni, each making their mark on the realm that would soon solidify and adhere to Alkosh's strict sphere of time. Hersin carefully contemplated how best to show Nerni his love. But before he could act, the singer approached her. Ifa was the celestial embodiment of charisma. He glided his graceful green fingers over Nerni's curves, and traced rivers through the forests of her dress. He showed the leaves how to change colour with the seasons, and taught the streams their tinkling ethereal tune. The singer created the first flower from the fabric of Nerni's dress, and presented it to her. Her scene saw the look they shared. Nerni had fallen for Ifa. When it was his turn to approach, Hercene could not bear to meet her eye. He professed his love right there. It was clumsy, it was brutish. He lumbered like an ox, and felt like a fool, too animalistic to win Nerni's heart. Hercene grew spiteful in his sorrow. He saw how angelic the other Aedra looked, and felt like a beast. Ifa, on the other hand, he flourished. He was inspired by his reciprocated love with Nerni. He taught the birds to sing, and the creatures of the forest followed his lilting voice. The very trees are said to have moved close to hear him sing on the warm summer nights of those elder days. Hercene felt himself falling into darkness. He saw the greatest beast of the forest following Ifa, the mighty Grat Elk. Hercene had never seen such a majestic animal. The hunter slipped into the folds of Nerni's dress and stalked the creature. He brandished his spear and pounced. He thrust the spear through the Grat Elk's heart, killing it instantly without so much as a yelp. The hunter took out his knife and severed the huge antlered head from the elk's neck, and fashioned a trophy from it. He placed it over his head. Never again would the god see the face that Nerni had spurned. Despite the brutality of his deed, Hercene felt a great sense of catharsis after the hunt. His love for Nerni never waned, it would forever remain as full as the Blood Moon. Nevertheless, the pain was too great, and Hercene retreated. He would not be an ancestor to mortals in the way that elves and men see it. He kept to his hunting grounds, reliving the thrill of slaying Ifri's champion. And so, Hercene became a Daedra Lord, gazing inward upon the mortal realm from outside. This is my interpretation of the Khajiiti tale of Hercene, reconciled with the more common belief that Hercene is not an ancestor to mortals. Unfortunately, this is not the end of Hercene's tragic tale, and while I regret having to add to the hunter's suffering, the story must be told in full. Traditionally, according to Old Mary belief, Jeffa was the first of the original spirits to transform himself into an Elnafe, or an Earthbone. This means he decided not to abandon Mundus, and dedicated his power in order to keep it functioning. This is the fundamental sacrifice that typically leads to the distinction between Aedra and Daedra. From this perspective, Jeffa is a heroic and selfless figure to mortals. However, as I learned from the Khajiit, who do not believe in this defining distinction, Ifa's transition into an Earthbone was not so valiant. The catfolk believe that Ifa was targeted by Namira, the Great Darkness, and he was gradually corrupted by it. How this happened remains a mystery for now, but Namira's influence changed the singer. Consumed by chaos, Ifa struck his beloved Nerni, killing her. This horrific act may just have doomed the mortal realm, and the Atada looked on in stunned disbelief. Hercene watched from afar, incapable of saving her from his hunting grounds. The hunter couldn't have fathomed a greater pain than that of being shunned by Nerni during creation. But he was wrong. Hercene's heart broke once more as the love of his life succumbed to her wounds. His misery turned to fury, and with the aid of Azura and Kanafi, Hercene slew Ifa. 
The singer had been given the greatest gift in the Orbis, and he'd squandered it. The free spirit stood over the bodies of Ifa and Nerni. The beauty was draining from Nerni as she faded. In order to preserve her splendor, Hersene, Azura, and Kanafi made a cairn for her out of Ifa's bones. This cairn was the first earth bone, and it allowed the life upon Nerni to endure. In most cultures, Hersene is considered a demon, while Ifri is venerated for his sublime creations. The catfolk see things differently. Though they still hear the echoes of Ifa's green songs, they do not listen, and they no longer speak of him. Hersene, on the other hand, is fond of Nerni's children, and walks among them often. Thus the Khajiit pray to him, especially when they stray from the path. Unlike Ifa, Hersene never betrayed Nerni, despite being scorned by her. The father of the hunt will always set the cats back upon the path. And while it's only a whisper among the inhabitants of elsewhere, some tribes claim that Hersene is the father of Nerni's first litter, the Khajiit, who were as changeable as Joan and Jode. They believe this is why the cats are the chosen race, the only ones capable of setting the moons back on their courses, protecting Nerni from the corruption of Namira's great darkness forever. Nerni never reciprocated Hersene's affection, yet Hersene continues to walk among Nerni's children, wearing the trophy of his rival's champion as his great antlered crown. Hersene will always love the thrill of the hunt, but his greatest love was lost to him long, long ago. And that is the tragic tale of her scene. Thanks so much for watching. I'm Drew the Daedrologist, you've been watching Drew Mora, and I'll see you in the next one.